Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, wherever you are in the world. Um, slight change for the channel. Uh, this is not going to be a general aviation flight, as you can tell, unless Cessna has suddenly started to go into the long haul uh, commercial airliner world. Um, but yeah, this is unmistakably a British Airways Airbus A350 dash 900, which doesn't exist, but we'll just skip over that small point for now. British Airways does not have, as far as I know, please do correct me in the comments, it's what they're there for, to correct people on the internet. Um, you know, there's nothing worse than somebody being wrong on the internet, so please do make use of those comments. Um, but yeah, the, the British Airways A350s are all the dash 1000s, um, the A35Ks, as they're known. Um, that's their ICAO code, the International Civil Aviation Organization code for this aircraft. The actual plane that I fly, which probably wouldn't even reach from the nose to the cockpit windows on this, I would imagine, or not far off that, um, that's a Cessna 150. That's ICAO code is C150. Boeing 747 is B74, and then the variant of the 747. So the ones that are flying today are normally 747-800s, so 747-8, seven four seven four hundreds which is what Lufthansa still flies seven four seven sorry B seven four fours I hope that's that's clear so um, what we're going to do today is we're going to fly this beautiful bird from here in Barcelona El Prat Airport on the Mediterranean without going through some of the buildings so you can just see in the distance there the Mediterranean behind the car park and that car park Oh, hang on, there's a Vueling just taking off by the looks of things. So I'm currently on VATSIM. VATSIM is an online flying air traffic control. Look at that go. And it's even selected, in fact, if I jump into the cockpit, if I remember my keys, it's even selected the Vueling yellow... Uh, yeah, that that is actually the Vueling livery as well, which is quite clever. Okay, so here we are in the cockpit. Um, I've done nothing apart from turn the battery on and then turn on all of the exterior equipment. Just to show you what you get, this is the Flight Factor A350. Um, and it's quite nice. I'm sure there's better ones out there, but I quite like just the complexity of this model. It looks really detailed. The liveries are nice. And it doesn't completely destroy your frame rate, this one. So I'm just running a, a GeForce GTX 1070. It's not the titanium, it's nothing special, um, and I'm still getting... I've, I've cranked things up a little bit just to make it a bit more pleasant for you, because I know not everyone has um, as, as, I guess, out-of-date graphics card as I do. Um, so with everything set to medium settings on X-Plane 12, this was running comfortably at about 70 frames per second. Um, I've increased things a little bit just for this recording, and it's gone to about 42, 45 frames per second, which is not bad. I would rather sacrifice a little bit of visual quality to maintain good flight model and uh, responsiveness to controls. There's nothing worse than dropping to five frames per second and small nudges of the of the control stick or the control wheel suddenly has you flying off in you know ninety degrees away from where you intended. That's terrible. So yes, we will uh, we will optimize for the flying qualities and the flying behaviors over the visual quality, and that's. I think Microsoft Flight Simulator is actually extremely smooth. It manages to balance both of those very, very well. But with X-Plane, you do have to make a conscious decision over which one you're going to sacrifice over the other. Um, my preference between the two is if I was flying VFR, I would prefer to do it in Microsoft Flight Simulator, but with X-Plane's flight models. I find the flight models in X-Plane are just more realistic than Microsoft Flight Simulator. But no one can argue Microsoft Flight Simulator is infinitely better looking than X-Plane, even though this does still look pretty good. X-Plane 12 is a good looking simulator. And I think a year ago, two years ago, we would have been extremely happy with this. This would have been state of the art. Okay, so what we're going to do now is I'm going to go through the starting up of this extremely complex, extremely complicated, long whole aircraft and to be honest it's not that difficult it's it's very straightforward it's been very very well designed 
first thing we need to do is get power into this bird. So we don't even have power to this screen here, which is the, the one that we use to switch on the, um, you know, open the doors, request the fuel, uh, the fuel truck, that sort of thing. So first thing we do is we look in this middle section here, and this is our electrics, electrical um, section. Turn on the battery, you get a ding, which means something is alive. You can see I've already plugged in the external power, but we'll get to that in a moment. We'll turn on all the batteries first. Then we'll turn on the external power. And we'll make sure that our friends who are in the back looking after the passengers also have power. Now generally in the Airbus you want to uh, work off a light out principle. So if the lights are out, everything is okay. If the lights are on, then something isn't quite right. So, to be honest, I don't know whether it's correct at this stage to put these generators on or off, but because you get a fault light, we will assume that the plane is telling us that that's not the right thing to do. But what's our current state? Our current state is we have battery power, but that's not being used. It's there as a backup. And we have the external power. We've got two external power carts currently giving us power. Okay, what's next? So now that we've got power into the aircraft... The thing that's going to take us a bit of time is to align these um, IRSs, the Air Data Inertial Reference Systems. So first thing we're going to do is get those into NAV, get those gyroscopes, laser gyroscopes, starting to align. And this is going to give us uh, very accurate position information once we're in flight. Okay, so there's a, there is actually a, help, uh, a helper to do this. Um, if you go to the, the checklist here, we can start working through these checklists. First one is electrical power up. Is the aircraft on battery power? Yes, we've done that. And then you can see it's skipped all the way through all of these because I've started to switch these on. So we've got external powers on, external powers on, all the batteries are on, and we can confirm we do have electrical power up. Let's see what's next. ECAM, so this is your uh, your engine control, oh, I always get this wrong, uh, monitoring system. So that's basically these screens here. So the ECAM is, it basically replaces the old flight engineer that you used to have on um, on older aircraft where you had to have three people in the cockpit so the ECAM basically takes someone's job away which is not great but you know that's progress ECAM auto mode so you control what's on the ECAM using these buttons down here and if you just look at the top left it's currently in door mode that's automatic as soon as the doors open this goes to door mode if I want to have a look at the fuel page, I'll click on the fuel page, you see that lights up in green, but that's no longer in auto mode because I've selected something. So you can see up here, we now have the fuel display. We've got plenty of fuel for this flight. We will be changing that based on the, um, the parameters of the flight that I put in the flight plan, which we'll come to in a moment. But you can see, we've now have the flight, sh uh, the fuel displayed on the ECAM. But if we change that back, if we turn that off, then we can say yes the ecam is in auto mode so it will change automatically based on what's required at that point in the stage of flight so the nss data to avionics these are basically um these are the settings up here so we will set the nss data to avionics we will set the cab data to nss and we will turn on the gate link so those are all on this is um, effectively your your uh, your avionics. This is the bay, this is the the computer bay that sits under the cockpit. And we just need to make sure that this is all switched on. But also because it's computers, we need to make sure that this is very well cooled. So we need to turn on the cooling, and we'll turn on these cabin fans as well. So we've completed the ecam and cockpit preparation checklist. Up next, let's turn on the APU, which is down here. So this is then going to allow us to switch over from the external power to the aircraft's own built-in auxiliary power unit. So the first thing we do is we turn on the master switch. That is effectively an electrical master switch. That's the, the main cable going from the power source, the battery, or the external power carts, to the APU at the back. The AP... One moment. Someone at my door. And this is why I don't do live streams because our house is a bit like a, a postal service distribution centre. Lots of stuff happening. Okay, so we were talking about the APU master switch. So this now means that the APU has electrical power. It uses electrical power to start, so we'll do that now. 
Um, in fact, sorry, we'll follow this. <laughs> let's follow the checklist. APU page is on the SD uh, on uh, on here. No, it's not. So we will go to APU, and then we can see that the APU is off. There's no N1, so the the turbine is not spinning, and the exhaust gas temperature is effectively zero. So it's uh, you know, 17 degrees, which is the external temperature. You can see down here, temperature at tip 17 degrees in sunny Barcelona. So um, yes, this is not generating any power. It's not switched on. So we can now confirm just by clicking anywhere on here. We just confirm it. And then we can say we will start the APU. If we go down here, we can actually watch it start. So you can see the N1, the turbine is starting to spin. The exhaust gas temperature is rocketing up. And in a moment, we should start seeing that it is available to provide power. And you can see the checklist has automatically confirmed it. This is not a dumb checklist. This this will respond to events happening within the aircraft itself, such as the APU power becoming available. You can see the it's quite clever, the APU is starting to throttle itself back down. Okay, next. So we look at the, the, the radio pages. So this is down here. Uh, we've got three radios. Uh, one of them is effectively used for uh, data. So there's uh, CPDLC, which is the um, the way that dispatchers at air airports will send flight plans and things like that, and um, the air traffic control will send clearances to the uh, to the aircrafts. So um, RMP one and two. Uh, I don't actually know what that means to be honest. I guess that means check VHF one and two. Frequencies are correct, so we will be flying on VATSIM. Uh, let's have a quick look. Pretty sure I saw. Yes, Barcelona Tower is on 118 100. So we'll click on there. 118 decimal 100. Let me just check to make sure that this has my audio set up. It does. So if I now switch, let me just turn down the audio just a moment, just in case this is loud. Swap that over. Okay, nothing coming through just yet. That's fine. So yes, we have tuned our frequencies. We've got Unicom ready on the other side for when we leave controlled airspace. Uh, Rad Nav standby off. Um, Rad Nav standby off. Where is that? Is that these? So you've got to kind of push in the top of the button. I'm going to say that's off. And then for some reason on the Flight Factor A350, in order to get this one to work, the volume, so if I just click on now, I'll, I'll get a pink, no, you haven't done this, warning. So let's reset, and then go down to volume. What I need to do is turn up the volume, and you can see it's automatically selected that to be done. It's a little strange, because you may not want full volume, but, you know. I'm getting old. I've subjected my ears to an awful lot of heavy metal and other loud music, so higher volume is good. Then we go to the squawk page, make this the master, and um, make sure our squawk is set for something useful. So squawk 7000 is the conspicuity code, that's like the standard nothing special code that all aircraft flying on VFR will set to. We are not flying VFR. So we will change this initially to 2000 until we get a squawk code. 2000 is the IFR conspicuity code. So squawk is set. So let's do a fire test. Go right up to the top, zoom out a touch. Um, APU agent light off, correct. APU uh, for both. Engine one fire push button switch guarded, correct. And two, so we can go through these, that's all s checked. All engine agent lights off. Correct, these are all off. Remember, lights out philosophy on the Airbuses. Correct, and then we test PB, so we push the test button, and this effectively runs a fire test, and this makes us, makes sure that the fire warning system is working. There we go. That looks good, and we should see down here that we actually have fire oops, on the, uh, the fuel cutoffs. So this is intending to make sure that if we have a fire in engine 1, we don't accidentally switch off engine 2 by mistake, which would be fairly catastrophic. So that's nice and handy. So yes, result, all good. 
and that is our electrical power setup. Let's go back to the overhead. So we need to allow the captain and the purser. So right now it's just on captain, but we also want our colleagues in the back to be able to initiate an evacuation in case for whatever reason the pilots are incapacitated. We want to give the uh, the crew an oxygen supply. Um, you can see everything else is set to nav, so maybe I do turn these things on a bit earlier myself than I should do, but it just takes so long if you've got the alignment set to a real time. It's just good to get these IRSs on earlier than later. I think see our strobe lights are off, um, but we do need to have some lights on as we're sat here. We need to have our nav lights on. Um, and we should probably have our logo light on as well, maybe not in bright daylight like this, but yeah. So, remaining lights is required. Seatbelts? No, we don't turn our seatbelts on until we have fueled the aircraft. So, let me close down this checklist for a moment. And if I go up to Plugins, Avitab, Toggle Tablet, you can see we have our flight plan here, which I have filed. I've created through Simbrief. If you go to simbrief.com, it's a free service from Navigraph, which is really generous. It's a really nice tool, really great bit of kit, and it allows you to generate. Um, extremely realistic flight plans. Um, it gives you the option of routes which have either previously been uh, given to people on VATSIM or are real world uh, routes between between places. So let's just read through this. Let's start at the top. So we are flying flight British Airways, so we'll be Speedbird 489. Today is the 26th of March. We're flying from Barcelona to London Heathrow. There's a re reaffirmation of our flight. Speedbird 489, 26th of March 2023, Barcelona to Heathrow. We are flying the A35, uh, A350 1000. Well, we are flying the A350 900, don't tell anyone. Uh, we are pretending we are flying British Airways uh, Golf X Ray Whiskey Bravo Bravo, which is uh, the second, because B, A, B, C, D, etc. It's the second extra wide body A350 that was delivered. Um, and you can see uh, it was created at 11.27 UTC, so the clocks have gone forward overnight, so um, this was 30 minutes ago, it's actually nearly 1 o'clock local time now, but it's nearly 12 o'clock UTC, and we have to be very careful of that to get used to uh, just having these dates as being the same as local. We are flying from Josep Taradeas to El, uh, El Heathrow, what's El Heathrow, what does that mean? Oh, is that El Josep Taradelas? I guess that's Barcelona El Prat, isn't it? Okay. Um, so, this is something to do with weather. I'll be honest, I don't know what this means. But it looks like, because that's 26, it's the 26th of March, I guess we're going to have to have weather updates at 1200 UTC and at 1500 UTC. I guess that's takeoff and landing. That would make sense, wouldn't it? I don't know if you can hear that. For some reason, X plane isn't coming through this device. Uh, it can come through this headset, rather. Okay, anyway. So let's keep going. So, uh, air traffic control call sign speedbird 489 uh, from Barcelona to Heathrow. 26th of March. Uh, expected takeoff time will be 1200 UTC, which we're going to miss this because I've got too much to do to hit that. Um, and we expect to land. So 1200 is our pushback time. That's six minutes away. We're not going to make that. You can see top right. That's local time, not UTC. We're not going to hit that. And then we expect 20 minutes of taxi time. We can probably make up a little bit of that taxi time. We expect to land at Heathrow at 211 UTC and we expect an 8 minute taxi to the stand. We're flying an A350-1000 ish and we have Trent XWB 97 engines. Um, calculated time of takeoff, we don't know that just yet but it will be probably 20 minutes late. Um, so our estimated takeoff weight will be what will be 214,700 kilos, so 214 metric tonnes our maximum takeoff weight is th over 300 tons, so we've got plenty of headroom there. Our maximum landing weight is 233 tons. We'll actually be landing at 203, which again is under 
and our max zero fuel weight so that's the weight of the aircraft without any fuel so this is the weight that does not change over the course of oh there's a tap taking off can i get it can i get it there he is tap portugal just taking off looks like an a330 <coughs> And our zero, so, so yeah, the zero fuel weight is basically the air, the aircraft weight that doesn't change because obviously throughout the flight we will be consuming fuel, um, and so the zero fuel weight is basically the fuel uh, the the aircraft without the fuel, and the landing weight is the zero fuel weight plus any remaining fuel. So we should expect to see around about seven point two kilos uh, tons of fuel. Seven point two kilos wouldn't get us very far. Seven point two tons of fuel. Um, should be left in the tanks when we land. Um, so alternate, uh, I've chosen Manchester because, um, to be honest, I'm not sure if the A350 can land at Gatwick. It'd be nice if it did, if it could, but I don't know. I know um, I have seen A350s land at, at um, Manchester. So, um, yeah, room with 23 left seems probably long enough for us there. Um, we will climb straight to flight level yeah. 380. And that was Barcelona Tower. Over to Unicorn, want to do a simulator. Bye bye, and have a great afternoon. Uh, Apache contact, thank you. Okay, so um, the one thing that uh, we need to be, uh, we need to set up is the cost index. So this basically says how much, how much do we want to balance towards performance rather than uh, economy. So, the the higher the cost index, the faster the aircraft will be allowed to fly. The, sl the the lower the cost index, the slower you will go, and the less fuel you will burn. Um, so the ground distance of this is actually not very much. You probably wouldn't even take an aircraft like this on this sort of journey. But I know that when British Air was introduced the Dreamliner and introduced um, the A380, they were flying training flights to uh, nearby European airports like this. So we'll just treat this as one of those. This is a 700 nautical mile by ground um, flight and we will be uh, flying 758 nautical miles. The great circle distance, if this was it, like you know point to point from straight from Barcelona straight to Heathrow, we would fly 620 nautical miles. So the difference, the additional 130 miles is us navigating around the different airways across Spain and across France. The average wind is from the west, 283 degrees, and the average speed is 56 knots. So yeah, the average, I think that's the wind correction, will be uh, um, you know, minus 31, I don't know what that is, I guess that's 31 degrees over the course of the flight, I don't know. So this bit I do know. So. The reason why I don't know these things is I'm not a commercial pilot. I'm a trainee or I'm a student PPL pilot. Um, so yeah, this is this is this is interesting. But ISA is something that I do know. This is the International Standard Atmosphere. So International Standard Atmosphere is um, is is basically the the temperature and the pressure density that defines a standard um, a standard atmosphere. That's how we do our calculations. That's what all of the uh, the performance books and everything are uh, for each aircraft is geared against and what we have to do here is we have to say the the temperature outside is plus five now the um which is interesting should be so i was i'm pretty sure that the ISA is 13 degrees so plus five indicates that it should be 18 degrees but did we not just see below that it was actually 17 degrees outside yes it's 17 so plus four, you see, plus four, I was right. So yeah, it's not a plus four, uh, plus five against the ISA, it's actually plus four. So at the point of generating this flight plan, it may have been different. Um, fuel bias, I don't know, take off alternate. So if you take off and all of a sudden a big uh, fog front rolls in, you need to have some alternate to take off just in case something happens like you lose an engine on takeoff um, I'm not going to choose the takeoff alternate the weather here is too nice we'll just come and land back here at Barcelona whoa okay so um, let's fill this bird with some fuel so we go over to our 
our screen here and this is what we use to um, control the things that you would normally control with um, with flight plans and dispatch notes and all those different things so let's have a look so our trip to London Heathrow will actually consume just under 11 kilos of uh, 11 tons I'm gonna say 11 kilos or I want to say kilos instead of tons a bunch so sorry in advance um, we have a contingency of 15 minutes which is just under one and a half tons so contingency is uh, 1.5 oh, okay we can't put decimals in we'll call it two we'll round it up and to get to our alternate after 15 minutes of holding um, that getting from London Heathrow up to Manchester will take uh, three tons so for the alternate we'll just round everything up um, APU time so we we think our taxi time here is going to be 20 minutes which is half a ton so we'll t say that's going to be uh, oh, hang on 20 minutes we'll say 25 because we've had the AP, run AP running for a little bit of time in fact we haven't even started fueling yet so that's fine but we'll just round things up a little bit the APU will be on for uh, let's just give ourselves 15 minutes and then so what's our total so far fuel on board 12 three three so we've got 12 and we need to get up to 18 so what do we want our final reserve four and then final reserve plus alternate should be five seven six trip plus taxis eleven four so that will come out to be eighteen six four five so we still need to find another six tons so we'll call that sixty five hundred oh hang on they're, they're just Uh, contingency so that's far too much fuel now 18320 we'll give ourselves another 1500 just to be safe so that's just nearly 20 tons of fuel hit implement bing and it says fuel loaded and we didn't see it but you actually would have seen the um, the aircraft settle down on its suspension which is quite cool so how many passengers are we going to take on this lovely flight of ours? Ooh, hang on. There we go. Uh, ooh, next page. Next page. So we want to carry 369. I don't think we have um, enough space on this three-class cabin to carry that many people, but we'll try. I think first class is 30? Nope. It's telling me that that's not a valid configuration. 20. Okay. So, yeah, that would make sense. Four rows of five. Business class, what have we got? Uh, two, four, six times four. So we should have... Is that right? Is my maths right? Is that 32? 36? There we go. Okay, so so far we've got 57 passengers on board, and I think we can only have 195 in economy class. 195, 6, 7, 8. 198. So, full flight, um, nowhere near the 369 estimated packs, passengers that we expected. Um, Let's have a look at the payload. So you want to take uh, 38 tons of cargo, 9.2. So you want to see cargo weight of 9 tons. So let's stick 5 in there. Stick a few more because we have got a bit more CG to play with. Um, cargo weight 10.5. That'll do. That'll do, won't it? What's the zero fuel weight we're looking for? 196.6. So we've still got quite a bit to go. We can stick an extra couple of tons in there and we'll add another couple of LD3 cargo containers to the back. How are we doing? Zero fuel weight, 189. Oh, let's stick a few more in. Let's get some, some cargo in the back here. 192. 
195. That's close enough. Fuel 18, uh, fuel uh, 18.6. So we are taking. Uh, sorry, let me just implement this first. Bing, passengers and cargo loaders. Oh, one thing I forgot to do. As soon as fuel is loaded, you go up here, and uh, no smoking signs should be on. That should be armed, and you turn on your seatbelt signs. That gets everyone to sit the heck down, um, and yeah, get ready to fly. I'm going to turn those on as well, just while I'm on that panel. So we've now got our aircraft is uh, fueled. We've got all of our passengers on board. I don't know if you can hear that chattering going on. Hang on. Let's uh, move this out of the way. And then we can turn the... Oh, I thought I would have turned off the passenger shutter by shutting the door. Is it actually shut? There it is there. It's shut. I don't know why I can hear the passengers so well, but there we go. Okie dokie, so let's work through this checklist again. Um, so, seatbelts is on, no smoking is on. We are going to do some things with the air conditioning unit now, which is up here. So, this is all switched off at the moment. Um, so, the crossbleed selector should be on auto. Temperature selectors as required. Um, I think people who've been in Barcelona will probably appreciate a slightly cooler cabin. Temperature selectors as required. Ecam, elec, in fact, I'm going to turn those packs on just because people will be sweltering. Next is the Ecam electrical DC page. So we know that we come down here, we set electrical DC, and we should see our electrical DC page here, which we do. All batteries currently below 60 amps. Battery one's on 20. Uh, sorry, it's five amps. Battery two is on five amps. Um, yeah, that all looks really healthy. Check that. APU generator push button, uh, which we've already pushed. Naughty us. Have we? Hang on, hang on. APU. Oh, sorry, that's not the generator push button. The APU generator push button is up here on the electrical panel. Of course, it is. APU generator fault light is off. Correct. Generators one. So we've got two generators on the left side. And we've got two generators on the right side. They're all on. Still showing fault because these are the generators that are in the engines. Um, and the engines aren't switched on yet because we haven't got there yet. Um, all the fuel pumps are switched on. Maintenance panel, all white lights off. I don't know where that is. Um, I'm basically going to go through and just make sure any lights are off at this stage, and then we'll turn on the hydraulic systems in a moment. Cabin pressure, anti-ice, calls, electrical power. Um, we'll turn those off in a moment. Maintenance panel. It all looks good. We'll come back to this hydraulic panel in a moment. Maintenance panel light, all white lights off, correct. Cargo air selector as required. Yep, then all that. Hydraulic pumps on. Why has that gone straight through? Shouldn't those be like that? Who knows? Air data selectors. All on. All on nav. Gear lever is down. While we're here we will flick the anti-skid system on. I don't think that's actually a flick switch like that in the real plane. I think there's either a button or some kind of setting somewhere. Um, and we will make sure our backup standby instruments is on. And that would have come on when I pressed the uh, carbon attitude um, standby compass? I don't know. Anyway, it's gone green. That's all we care about. So the next thing that we need to worry about, let's just close this 
down for a second is we're going to go down here we're going to click on this panel now we're going to go into the survey system surveillance system here we're going to make sure that everything is switched on surveillance system one is on surveillance system two is on go across to the controls page set the expander uh, the expander the transponder to uh, auto now for some reason I don't think you can set it in here you've got to go down to here set the mode to auto on the squawk page hit mode until you get to auto now we can set a TARA norm here so we can we can actually click on this one here or we can actually set it down here so can we maybe not maybe not TARA there we go my mistake. So then we turn on the weather radar, um, predictive radar, and then we set it all basically to auto. Um, terrain anti collision warning system. Turn all that on. And then we go to the init page. That's in the FMS. Into the init page. And we can go straight into the company route. In fact, we'll go to Route Select. You can see all the different flights I've been doing lately. We're looking for LEBL EGNT01. LEBL EGLL01. Hit Apply. Our cruising altitude today will be 380. And our CI, our cost index, was 183198. So that basically defines the performance that we'll have today. Our flight number is Speedbird 489 and what we'll do is we'll quickly have a look at the flight plan. So we're going to take off, um, oh there's one thing that we can do also on the init page which I'm surprised is not in the checklist and that's if you go into IRS, click on Align IRS that should align us onto the GPS signal and you can now start to see things are happening up here. If we go to ARC, in fact if we go to plan, you can see that if we go back to flight plan, uh, we're going to take off, we're going to go straight to NATP, I don't think we'll do that, I think we will actually put a, um, a SID in, standard instrument departure in. So we've got NATP, Evnum, AGN, Sechi, Uveli, CNA, Manak, Tirav. So basically what we're looking for is that we don't have any of these, um, any waypoints put in incorrectly. They're all basically heading from the south to the north towards EGLL Heathrow. So that's great. What we should have on our flight plan is a departure, a standard instrument departure, a SID. So NATP1 Delta is our standard departure. So what we can do is click on Barcelona, go to departure, choose the, oh actually we don't know the runway we're, ta we're taking off from yet, and Barcelona's uh, not online. So we're going to choose uh, 25 left, because we uh, generally 25 left is the takeoff runway, 25 right is the arrivals runway. We're going to choose the SID, which is NAT P1 Delta. We're going to go down to NAT P1 Delta. NAT P... Ooh. I'll have to choose NAT P1 Quebec. Which is fine. Temporary flight plan, insert, and then we'll just see what that does to our... Um... to our route. So we are going to go down the runway. At 500 feet we're going to make a left turn to intercept the departure there. We're going to fly to Dotus and then we're going to make a right turn eventually and that's going to take us up to BL055 
and then after BL055 we'll go to BL060 make a slight right turn towards the north on a heading of 353 degrees and that should take us up to Natpi. Okay, so we know what we're, what's going to happen on the takeoff, which is nice. Good to know. Let's get back to the checklist. Uh, so, Barrow, so we need to find out what the, the local weather is. So I'm going to ask um, XPilot, which is what I use to connect to VATSIM. So if you do dot, the, the period key, WX, LEBL, hit enter. And that says uh, Meta, LEBL. 26th of March, 1200 Zulu, so that's 15 minutes ago. Wind is 230, it's at 17 knots. Um, visibility is uh, unlimited. There's a few clouds at 3500 feet, scattered clouds at 6000 feet. Current temperature outside is 20, I don't believe you. Um, and the current dew points, that's the point at which the, the moisture in the air turns into fog basically condenses is 11 degrees and the QNH which is the pressure setting for uh, for aircraft leaving the vicinity of the airfield is 1013 so we have 1013 now that's a very easy one to remember it sounds if you're brand new to flying 1013 sounds like the most random number in the universe totally get that what it means is 1,013 hectopascals, and that probably doesn't help. It still probably sounds like the most random thing in the world, but this is what we call our standard temperature, uh, sorry, standard pressure setting. Once you're away from the airfields, you use a standard setting that everybody uses, even if it's not the pressure setting of the of the region you're flying in. What it means is, if everyone's flying on the same pressure setting, then everyone will have the same incorrect. Um, altimeter setting so the altitude that's showing on their altitude gauges will be equally incorrect so everyone just chooses a standard setting 1013 is what we use across Europe and most of the world and if I go to inches of mercury whoops if I go to inches of mercury how do I switch there we go you can see that in the United States of America and uh, I believe in Canada as well um, they use inches of mercury so 29.92 inches of mercury is the standard pressure setting in the States. Um, but we are flying in Europe, so we will use QNH, hectopascals. So check. Um, oh, actually, is that on 10.13 as well? It certainly is. Okie doke. Um, I've just noticed our trim setting here. So what we'll do is we will have a quick look at what our trim setting should be by going into here. Performance calculator. Um, we will set the runway slope to be zero. We're going to take off with one notch of flaps. Um, and our. Where's the. Zero fuel weight CG. Ah, so this is. I don't know if I'm skipping ahead here, but we will come to do this in a moment. Let's just have a look. Yeah, let's, let's sort that out now. So we need to go into uh, here, and we need to set up the performance screen again. I don't know why it hasn't asked us to do that yet. Um, so fuel and load first. So our zero fuel weight is 195.1 tonnes. Our zero fuel weight centre of gravity is 24%. Our total block fuel is... Uh, 20 tons. So we'll put it in as uh, put it as 19.9, and that should then set up lots of calculations that gives us performance and best angle of climb and all that sort of thing. Um, so root reserve was seven. Um, alternate was three. Um, minimum fuel at destination needs to be six tons. Okay, so we should arrive at Heathrow after one hour and thirty-four minutes of flight with nine tons on board. Now then, if we go to the performance tab, if we go to performance calculator, this is where we tell the aircraft what our speeds are for takeoff. So V1 is changing for some reason. One four six. VR, 
that's the speed at which we rotate is 146. So that means that the runway is long enough for us to rotate before actually hitting our V1, which is our um, sing uh, sorry, V1 is our decision speed. So we're going to hit our decision speed after rotate. So naturally the rotate speed becomes our decision point at which w whether to continue or not. So we can go all the way up to our rotate speed and if something happens all the way up to that rotate speed of 146 knots we can decide to uh, close the throttles, slam the brakes on and come to a halt. That's a good good place to be. If your runway is shorter your V1 decision point whether to go or no go is often lower than the rotate point. But Barcelona's got some really nice big long runways. V2 is uh, 148 knots and that is our single engine climb speed that's the best rate of climb on a single engine so if somewhere between 146 and 148 knots we find that um, the engine explodes then we can uh, lower the nose uh, <clears throat> find 148 knots and then just maintain that speed and that will give us the best rate of climb on a single engine we are not going to do full takeoff go around power we're going to save the engines we're going to use the flex temperature from down here which is 61 and that is going to effectively tell the aircraft tell the engines that excuse me i need to cough how do i mute this okay i think that worked that's basically saying to the aircraft that we are in an, in an environment which is 61 degrees outside and it needs to turn down the power a little bit just to save the engines <coughs> Still fighting off a little bit of a, a chest cold. Um, okay, so let's have a look at the next parts of the checklist. So ND mode and range as required. So we want that in arc mode. We want that to be 10 miles. So we've got clear view of that path we need to take after takeoff. Check. Primary flight display is on. North reference. Uh, how do we change the reference? Ah, so we change it to uh, between true and magnetic you can see it's set to magnetic at the moment you only generally use true when you are um, when you are in the very very northern or very very southern uh, latitudes that's checked speed mac window dashed speed mac window dashed check heading track window dashed correct heading vertical speed track fpa heading vertical speed so we can switch this between um, the FPA mode, which is the flight path ooh, flight path angle, um, or vertical speed. So we'll set to vertical speed. Um, altitude window is initial clearance. Well, we've got no um, we've got no air traffic control on board right now. So let's be cheeky and just fly straight up to our um, up to what's Alsace. Is that Swiss? I think that's Swiss. Yep, so that's all Swiss. So Switzerland has got some good coverage of air traffic control right now. We don't. So let's switch back to VHF and uh, we will switch back to Unicom. Initial uh, clearance. We've given ourselves initial clearance to 38,000 feet and we are done. Um before pushback okay so fuel quantity is checked final load sheet is checked zero fuel weight zero fuel central gravity in the fms we did that ecam cwcg cwcg is 26 percent 26 percent takeoff trimble horizontal stabilizer for 32 that seems why is that there should that come down Yes. Okay, yeah. So I, I believe those two should match. That's our, uh, what the horizontal stabilizer trim should be set to. Check that. Seats, seat belt, pedals, adjusted, external power. So let's just check. We are on the APU generator. So we should be able to turn those off. That's great. And you can see now that's set itself to off. So 
I believe we still have chocks. So if I just change my position, go look down here, I can turn the park brake off. I'm actually going to leave that on for a moment, just while I go through a few final checks. Okay. So this is all good. This is all nice. We've still got 45 frames a second, which I don't think is bad, given the number of world objects and the complexity of this aircraft. Uh, we've got our QNH is set across the board. Let's have a quick check of the ECAM warnings. So our doors aren't closed. That's the next thing that we need to do. We need to prepare to depart. So we've got ground service, doors and hatches, close all the doors. And if we go outside quickly, you can see all the doors are closing. That's quite sweet. And we should see the cargo doors have closed now as well. Let's jump back inside. Can I leave that on? While I'm outside? Oh, I can. That's great. So now we can start getting rid of some of this ground equipment. Where's a good place to put this? Ground equipment. So, let's get rid of the stairs. I say the word so a lot. Apologies. You're just going to have to bear with it. Get rid of the stairs. They've gone. Get rid of the passenger bus. Get rid of the fuel truck. Get rid of the luggage loaders. Get rid of the air conditioning cart. Get rid of the ULD cart. Cleaning truck. Disconnect the electrical power. We've, we've switched across to our APU. Disconnect the high pressure air conditioning unit. And the next thing that we will do is call for pushback. Hit pushback. Hit push, and you can see we have at the front of the aircraft a tug is coming to connect up to the front. Beautiful. And the way that you control this, as you can see here, is you use the throttle and the rudder pedals to control your direction. So we're, we're going to push back and we're going to push the tail to the left, so our nose will be pointing to the east. So it says there, parking brake off, that's a request. We're not going to do that just yet. Uh, let's quickly pop back inside. Um, so we have air pack fault, that's because I probably haven't turned on the APU bleed, which is correct. And we should see that error go away. That's good. Set this back to auto because it looks like it's still on the DC page. And all the doors are closed. Uh, this is all looking good. I'm going to turn on the... Okay, flight directors are already on. This is looking good. Okay, so we will take the parking brake off now. Click. And we will steer this aircraft. I like to do this from the outside just because in the real world you would have... Um, actual people helping you uh, to do this. So brakes are off. If I push forward on the throttle, um, hang on, did I take off the chocks? Nope. That's why we're not moving. And as we're doing that, I'm going to set the engine start, set that to one because I know that that's the next things that we need to do on the checklist. So push back truck is called back, engine start, engine hydraulic pumps need to be on, beacon light needs to be on, ECAM auto mode, uh, correct, engine mode to start and then that should be set to 1. Okay, so let's get rid of this for a moment and then what we need to do is turn to the right. I think what we can do is if we stop there, is we can then switch to pull mode, push back, pull, and if we then go outside, I've never done the pull before, I've always just pushed straight back, but I think what we should be able to do is then get that tug to pull us onto that taxiway there. That sounds like engine number one is starting up quite nicely. Ah, and it actually uses, if you have a separate axis on your joystick set up for um, your nose wheel tiller, it actually controls, controls the, the tug. 
Okay, so that looks good to me there. We will jump back inside, we will set the park break, and we will dismiss the, uh, the tug, which we should see if we just bump up a little bit. Do we see it? No. Oh yeah, there it is. Should see that. Jump across to the first officer's side. There he goes. See you to go. Oh, it's just finished. So now we are in a good place. Um, the next thing that we want to do is jump across to the checklist and switch on engine number two. How long have we been recording? Nearly an hour. Nearly an hour to get an Airbus A350 prepared for departure. That's probably about right. Yep, these are not um these are not simple machines. And then we should see on here we've got so this is a Rolls Royce engine. Rolls Royce engines can be easily identified in some cases by the fact that they have three spools. N one, which is the big fan at the front, N two, which is in most aircraft the high pressure turbine, but then this is an intermediate pressure turbine, and then N three, which I believe is the high pressure turbine on Rolls Royce aircraft. So we now have two engines started, both comfortable around about 21 N, uh, 21 N1. Very similar fuel flows. Um, we've got engine pressure. Uh, I'm guessing. Oh, now it's gone to automatically switch to the tyre temperatures. You can see here you've got lots of Ys and Gs and Bs. Is there any Bs? No, maybe not on, the, on this one. Uh, on the uh, on the wheels. These are hydraulic systems and I think this is the hydraulic hydraulics for the brakes. So on this aircraft we've got three hydraulic systems, yellow, blue and green. So the Y's are the yellows, G's, green, B's, blue. And it looks like the brakes for the front brakes are controlled by the yellow hydraulic system and the rear brakes are the green system. Um, which is which is good because if you have a failure, um, which sometimes happens, then you, the uh, you know you've still got some brakes. Lots and lots of redundancy on these aircrafts. So we've still got our engine mode to start. Put it back to normal. If you bleed, can go off, which is up here. If you bleed, is off. Anti ice is required. Definitely don't need that in Barcelona. If you master switch, off. If you generate a push button, which is there off ground spoilers armed sorry if this is a lot of moving around but this is what we need to do so the ground spoiler arms as you grab hold of it and you push it all the way forward and you get a little indicator in front of you here which is that blue arrow saying that the these are armed but they're not up flap lever set so we've said that we're going to take off with uh, one notch of flaps flaps to one checked Pitch and trim, we went through all that before. Oh, ECAM status, yeah, let's just quickly check that. So take off config test. This, in the, in history, throughout history, a lot of aircraft have crashed after takeoff because they just weren't configured correctly. The pilots may have forgotten to lower the flaps or there may be some sort of other configuration setting. Um, so these are the things that all get checked. So things like the speed brake being armed, um, flaps to take off, is the cabin ready? Are the signs on? Those sorts of things. Because we shouldn't be taking off unless we've got the passenger seatbelt signs on, for example. So we go down here, we hit take off config, and then we lose that orange menu, uh, orange message on the top there, and it becomes a green message at the bottom here saying take off config normal. So we are ready to go, people. We are ready to get this bird into the air. What I'm going to quickly do, just because I use two different uh, flight yokes, I just, I'm just going to quickly check that we've got roll on this joystick we do, we've got pitch and we've got your we've got all those things, that's great because it's hit me before where I've tried to take off and then I have no pitch and we quickly crashed um, a few other electrical systems that we need to just set up uh, or switch off or on in this case let's go up here so turn the wireless on, turn passenger data off don't know why we turn it off. Um, cabin sat calm, landing camera, that's so cool. 
bar four. That's already on. Why is that? I don't understand. Uh, Mobcom IFAC DER. I do not know what those are. Speak to a proper Airbus pilot. And then ready for taxi. So we're going to turn the nose lights on. All the lights are down here, handily in one area at the bottom. So we are going to. One slightly annoying thing about the flight factor A350 is that if you just want to turn on the taxi lights, it goes to full nose on, which is what you generally put on on final, um, so very bright, and then it, it flicks back to taxi. Not the end of the world, but um, yeah, that's just what it is. We'll turn the park brakes off in a moment. Thrust levers as required. Auto brake RTO. So RTO armed is there. So this is rejected takeoff. If something happens during the takeoff roll that we're not happy with and we want to reject the takeoff and stop, all we have to do is close the throttles. And then this rejected takeoff system will automatically apply brakes to slow us down. Um, let's just turn off the parking brake and I'll just hold on the tow brakes for now. Thrust levers as required, auto brake RTO. And then we'll get down to this options get down to strobe lights okay so we're now going to taxi I'm going to have a quick look at my uh, can I Whoa. do I have any airport charts in here I don't think I do let's go back to the home airports L E B L hopefully Oh, why on? Why is there nothing? Okay, aerodrome chart. This the only page? Uh, yeah, I don't want that. Here we go. So we are. We've just pushed back from gate two hundred, which is here. We are currently on this taxiway here. So we kind of want to turn left, either at Bravo Sierra or Charlie Sierra, onto, that must be the Mike, onto Mike, is that right? Because where we want to be is along here. This makes no sense to me, hang on, let me try a, a better chart. Ground movement chart, GMC. This looks more like it. So we're going to go through gate, let's go through gate Charlie Sierra and then along to Delta 2, down Delta to Delta 1 and then we want to go along Kilo to the holding point here for runway 24 left. Okay. Is there a way for us to show the aircraft on here? I thought there was. Ooh, what's that done? Oh no, oh no. Okay, we're good. Yeah, I really thought that would have put a picture of the aircraft on here, but it hasn't. Oh, well, we're rolling. Okay, that's not good. Okay, so Charlie, Charlie Sierra, onto Mike, I guess, and then Delta Kilo can see Bravo Sierra is there. Let's just take Bravo Sierra. <coughs> we'll do a quick radio call. And just, there's nobody else in there. Okay. Just trying to think of what I need to say before I say it. Barcelona traffic speedbird 489 just push back from stand 200 taxing to holding point for runway 24 left via Bravo Sierra Mike Delta Kilo Barcelona so the important thing is to um, in the UK we've got something called safety com which I'll talk about as we start to taxi out um, safety com is like this backup frequency it's like unicom on VATSIM um, and it's 135.480 and if you're flying into an airfield that doesn't have any um, published radio frequencies uh, then you can use safety com 
And safety comm can be used within 10 nautical miles of an airfield and um, up to, but not above, a thousand feet above the circuit height. Is it the circuit height or the joining height? I'm going to have to double check that before I go for my exams. But yeah, so it's only within like a very small region around the airfield. Now this, this is not turning particularly nicely for some reason. I've got full right lock. Can you, can you see it? Is it animated? No. Nose wheel tiller is not animated. So we should now be on mic. That was a horrendous turn. We want to go all the way down to Delta. So look for a sign that says Delta 2. There's Echo 4. What's that over there? That's Mike 5. Going a bit quick. Pull up our charts again. Avitab, toggle position. So there's Echo 4, and then Delta comes after that. So This is not, today, a masterclass in how to taxi an A350, I'm afraid. So we've got rolling 5-1 Delta Yankee coming into land. Slow it down a bit, let's go on a bit quick. So that is Echo 4, I believe. So we should see this next one is Delta... Delta. That's Delta 2 there. Yep, so we're going to cross the crosswind runway here. So you want to drive past where you want to turn before you start turning because that nose wheel is about 20 feet behind the cockpit. And then we'll let people know that we're crossing the crosswind runway. Barcelona traffic speedbird 489 crossing the crosswind runway 2002 uh, Barcelona. Barcelona traffic falling 51 Delta Juliet fully established ILS runway 24 right. 24 right. So that's not going to be impacting us at all. Just quickly check because not everyone might be on the same on the correct frequency. One hour and ten minutes in, plus a visit from my wife's pre-prepared food guy. Don't think that's too bad. Did he say left? He did say left, didn't he? Hmm. So last time I took off from Barcelona, we took off from 24 left and we landed on 24 right. So that's what I'm basing this off. I could go on flight radar and see what is being used in the real world. Is that for the left or is that for the right? What did he say? Barcelona traffic rolling 5-1 Delta Yankee full, uh, 5 miles final runway 24 right and landing. 24 right, okay, no factor then. Okay, so let's have a look at the pre takeoff checklists. We need our strobe lights on. Just turn everything on. Wing on, nose lights on. Notify the cockpit, no, the cockpit, the cabin that we're about to take off. <coughs> That's all good. Next thing that we do is set the 
chrono, which is the big round button at the top, and that's how we can time our takeoff, uh, time our flight, even. So we're going to go full length. So we're going to go right to the end of here. That's the runway just there, off to our right. Just check we are in arc. We have ten set there. I want constraints to be visual on the PFD on the, on the ND rather the navigation display. We have correct trim. We have correct flaps. We have RTO. Everything is looking rather good. And a windsock just off to the right there, showing that we are using the correct runway. In fact, let's not go full full length. Let's go semi full length to here. We'll do a radio call. Barcelona traffic speedbird 489 lining up and taking off runway 24 left. Uh, Barcelona. So this takes you full length anyway. So this is common of airports. There's like an area over there. If, if we had a problem, we needed to wait. They would send us off over there, and then we can just wait. And then any other traffic wanting to do a full length takeoff can just go this route. Um, even smaller airports. My local airport, you may be able to tell from the accent, is Newcastle Airport, and um, they have one of these holding points at the end of the Delta taxiway just before you get onto runway two five. Let's just pause here, see what kind of a landing this guy does. Go on dude, we're all rooting for you. Get it down, get it down, get it down. And they're down. Awesome. <coughs> Fingers crossed we have similar luck when we get into Heathrow. So let's turn this giant beast of an aircraft around. So these aircraft are fitted with cameras in the tail to help with taxiing because they're extremely large. This one obviously is not as large as the one British Airways really flies. The 1000 model, this is just the 900. Practically a baby. Obviously not a baby, it's still huge. So we'll try and get nicely lined up. For some reason the turning circle on the 350 is not what I expected it to be. Okay, so we are lined up. Barcelona traffic swelling 51 Delta Yankee located runway 24 right. Okay, so we're going to push the throttles forward. Everything's coming forward nicely, set to manual flex, half, joystick forward, side stick forward, until we get up to, uh, I believe it's 80 knots, maybe 100, I'll do it to 100. Now this accelerates really quickly, you can see the speed coming up, already at 100 knots, so side stick back. So for something this large to accelerate so fast, it's unreal. And then we're going to pull back here. Pull the nose up. To maintain. What was our V2 plus 10? So immediately we're going into that left turn. Gear still down. You hear the gear coming up. I'm sure this is something that becomes very natural. Um, so I'll put this thrust back to climb, lower the nose. Yeah, I'm sure the the way the side stick works in the Airbus isn't the way that the controls work in a conventional aircraft. So you, you basically request a roll rate rather than actual aileron or um, 
yeah, rather than actual aileron deflection like you do in, I'm going to call them normal aircraft, non-computerized aircraft perhaps we should say. So we've gone beyond our slat extension speed. So we'll pull those up and the, uh, the wing is now clean. There's nothing hanging out of the wing that might um, cause drag. I'm just going to put that straight into autopilot because we've got checklists to run and we'd normally have a somebody else. Oh, we didn't hit chrono. Chrono. Take off thrust, V1 monitor rotated, autopilot is required, thrust levers are in climb, uh, run with turn off lights up here can go off, and the ground spoilers. This is something else that appears to be broken on the Fight Factor A350. This is relatively up to date. I think it's about a week or so since I last updated it. But if I uh, so remember what we said before, over our, underneath the primary flight display, we have that little blue tick, uh, the little arrow, um, because we put the ground spoilers into arm. If we set, if we pull these back so that that blue arrow disappears, there's no other indication apart from that blue arrow disappearing. Click, click, that's gone. So it's no longer armed, but on here it says that it doesn't give you an indication that they have disarmed. And if I click on here, you get a pink, you haven't disarmed the ground spoilers warning, which we clearly have. So that seems to be a bug. Let's go through the after takeoff checklist. APU bleed was off before, APU masters which was off before, anti-ice is not required. In the climb, um, the barrel reference, so we're still flying, we're basically flying on standard anyway. Um, what is so what we should be doing at this point is going into our charts going to a standard instrument departure chart and having a look to find out what the um, transition altitude is does it say on here transition altitude 6000 feet Okay, so we've just blasted through there, and you can see this is starting to flash. If we click on here, it goes from 1013 into standard. Um, so yes, the barrel ref is standard as required. Cruise flight level set as required. We're going to climb straight up to 38,000 feet, flight level 380. Anti-ice is not required. Seatbelt as required. When we get to 10,000 feet, we are going to let the wonderful passengers in the back of our plane... God, this is pretty. Uh, we're going to allow them to turn the seatbelts off. That is something else, isn't it? So pretty. Wowzers. So we should be, okay, we're through 10,000 feet now. We will switch off the seatbelt sign. Click. Let our wonderful passengers roam. Seatbelts required. ECAM memo review. So ECAM, the only thing that's showing is no smoking. That's correct. Nav aids. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're flying. We've got VOR, VOR1, VOR2 heading towards PRA, wherever that is. I'm not quite sure. But PRA looks to be off to the right and behind. Ah, so that's PRA, which will be Barcelona El Prat. So we are 11 miles as the crow flies, or the A350 flies, away from Barcelona El Prat. And this VOR, uh, oh god, I'm going to mess this up, um, VHF Omnidirectional Range Beacon, which is on the airport, is currently telling the aircraft where it is, which is nice. You can see, we're not following the green line, are we? The green line is like clocked off to the right-hand side by a you know, few minutes on the clock. And that's because of the wind. So the wind is currently from the north, uh, from our northwest position, uh, a bearing of um, a compass bearing of two seven zero degrees. So we're, we effectively need to turn our nose into the wind a little bit to travel on this track. So the green is the track, and the yellow is the nose. So the they are often not aligned because the wind is almost never exactly on the nose or exactly on the tail so we always have to point the nose either into the wind or away from the wind normally into the wind um, to keep on track so we are coming up to our next waypoint which is uh, Bravo Lima 055 
and there's a constraint because I turned constraints on up here and the constraint is that we must be at flight level 120 so f uh, 12,000 feet or above let's quickly check we are nearly 14,000 feet flight level 140 so yes we have achieved that constraint the next thing it asks for is opt maxed altitude so we can't just keep climbing and climbing to any altitude that we want we need to select um, an altitude that works uh, that we can actually fly to so our cruise altitude is set to 380 optimally so the most fuel efficient altitude for us right now is effectively flight level 370 but if you wanted to we could fly up to flight level 480, uh, 400 so 40,000 feet um, and still have a little bit of performance left so climbing straight to 380 is not going to be a problem for us so that is also checked cruise we're not there yet but we we will run this checklist when we see alt cruise the altitude cruise on the flight management system it will actually appear up here uh, yeah thrust thrust cruise will be up there um, yeah great so we are on our way out of Barcelona beautiful Barcelona Still some strange clouds in X-Plane 12. Um, those ones don't look so bad. In fact, I'm going to get a screenshot of that because that's quite pretty. They're still a little bit like popcorn. Um, they just seem a bit, I don't know, they just seem a bit dense or something. But these ones off in the distance, they are just crazy. But you do get cloud shadows on the ground, which is quite cool. Farewell to the Mediterranean for this trip. We'll come back. I love the reflections. They just look so good. You can see straight through the cabin to the windows on the other side. That's nice. In fact, would you like a tour? Did you know? We can, if I remember my key, oh no, it's backwards. Um, if I open the door, unlock. Just ignore the warning. Wrong way. So I'm hoping, hang on, I've just heard the engines roll back. What's happened? Why have the why have the engines just rolled back? Is that because of that? That's cool. So in the event of Why are we descending? Why are we descending? Right. Disconnect the autopilot. I'm going to pull on this, so that's going to take us straight to 38,000 feet. Reconnect the autopilot. So we've got autopilot one showing on there. Why are we not climbing? So we'll request a vertical climb of 2,000 feet per minute, which we shouldn't have to do. Get rid of that warning because that's just the autopilot coming off. Bring up the engine page. Is everything all right with the engines? We've got no thrust. We've got N1. We've got N2. 
Gonna turn off the auto throttle. That'll give me a warning. Mm, I have no throttle control. Okay, so I can't keep climbing. Gonna have to take over a moment here. Otherwise, we're gonna stall. Turn off that annoying alarm again. So, what's wrong? Uh, there's no errors. I'm just going to make sure this isn't some kind of a failure. It's not a failure, we just have no throttle control. What on earth is going on? Do we have roll? We've got roll. Well, this is deeply, deeply worrying. Okay, I guess we need to look. So, yeah, this is just literally not giving me any throttle at all. Why? What would cause that? Oh, it's come back now. Weird. Turn the auto throttle back on. Try and get these to go back to where they were. Well, that was a good moment to be wearing my brown underwear. I have absolutely no idea what happened there. Autopilot's back on, it's going to get us over to Bravo Lima 060. No constraints. Just keep an eye on that speed, make sure it's not going to try and. So that to me looked a bit like a bug in the A350, the flight factor. Um, it does happen. These are very complicated machines, um, but it's also just a little bit disconcerting. Just means that, you know, sometimes you have to step out the cockpit for a couple of minutes, don't you? And uh, Lord knows what you come back to see. Okay, so we are still in the cruise. Um, why don't we just do a quick tour of some of the other systems? Um, what can we have a look at in here? There's quite a few things which aren't yet modelled, which again is okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, what can we look at? So we can have a look at these are all the different systems that are feeding into our current location, our awareness of our location. You've got your... Um, so the FMS is FMS-1, which is the captain's flight management system, is currently running off, uh, is currently using this as its location, based on three IRSs and three GPS sources. And FMS-2, the co-pilots, the first officers, is also running off the same. I don't need to cough. Um, you can see we've got three IRSs, we've got, oh, we've got two GPS sources. Um, let's just see how far away we are from uh, LEMD, which is Madrid. Okay, that doesn't work. Marvellous. Okay, GPS. This is quite cool. All this is modelled. 
Interesting that the altitude seems to be slightly out between the two of them. There's about a hundred foot altitude difference. It's all these little differences that would have just been so easy to actually just have one GPS modelled and just have these shown in two different places. Um, would have, that would have been the easy way to do it, but it looks like they've got like separate GPSs modelled. There's different jitter. It's yeah, this is really nice. Um, IRSs are all aligned. So you can see, if we were off track, beneath the aircraft it would say L and then a, a decimal number, or R and then a decimal number, and that would be how far left or right in nautical miles of the track that you were. It's quite common to do something in, uh, particularly over Africa, which doesn't have the best air traffic control coverage, um, but there are plenty of other places around the world, but that's that's probably the, the, the largest area without consistent um, air traffic control coverage. Where, where you fly down an airway, you may have an aircraft coming the other way on the same airway. Now what you should be doing is, is, um, is observing a rule in flying, which is if you're flying between uh, one degree on the compass and 180 degrees on the compass, so basically east or south, then you should be flying on odd flight levels. And again, if you're flying from 181 degrees all the way through to 360 degrees or zero, then you should be on even flight levels. But if your flight takes you slightly left a bit, slightly right a bit, you know, it's, it depends what the average is, you might actually end up on the wrong flight level for the direction of travel that you're, you're flying in. So pilots adopt something called slop, which I believe is standard linear offset position, something like that. I could probably Google it, you could probably Google it. And slop is basically um, a standard practice where aircraft will always fly two nautical miles to the right of the track of the airway. So if you're travelling one direction, you're off to the right, and if you're travelling in the other direction, you're two miles on the other side of the airway from from the other way that the, air tra that the traffic is going. So you basically end up with four nautical miles of separation um, for any aircraft flying on that on that airway. Um, and for those aircraft that don't observe it, then you're still two nautical miles away, which is you know that's that's enough. So you can see NATP has just come into view on the ND, on the navigational display. Um, NATP is the uh, the end of our standard instrument departure, the SID. If I pull the Avitab tablet back up again. I don't know why that doesn't just resize. So if we go back to charts. Well, hey. Let's have a look at. Oh, hang on, we are miles back. Let's go page four. I think is the. Yep. So there's oh Villanova, nice. Cardo. Nat P. No, that's not the right page, is it? Uh, of course, this is going to be different, isn't it? Because we chose to do the NATP-1 Quebec takeoff. But let's just have a look. Let's just compare the numbers. So at NATP, on the NATP-1 Delta, we expected to have 14.2 um, kilos of fuel on board. And we expected to have burnt 4.5 kilos. So um, move this off to the right. Total fuel used is 1.5 kilos. Is that what that column means? I think it is. 3.8. Yeah, that seems to suggest that that's what that is. So we, we seem to be being extremely frugal on our fuel today. Fuel used 780 kilos on each side. Currently using 5.5 tons per side. That seems low, to be honest. Uh, is there any other information we can find in here about fuel? Active fuel and load. Uh, 
have a look in the fuel page. Uh, so if we go down here, click on fuel. You'll flow 175 kilos per minute. That's like two of me in fuel every minute. That's crazy. Big wings, anyway. Big fuel tanks. Um, so we've still got got 2.6. That why have we got that much fuel? We didn't ask for that much fuel, did we? Something's not quite right here. Quite sure. We asked for fuel on board 19.8 kilos, and that was loaded. So why is this trying to tell us that we have fuel on board 26 kilos? I do not understand that. It's actually quite scary watching the fuel go down like this, because you know when that gets to zero you can't fly anymore. Okay, let's just check. Nobody's communicating with us on here. Does, uh, does Avitab have a browser built in? Go to home. Maps, maybe. Ooh, look at that. Very nice. What's that? It's obviously another aircraft. Not that stupid. So you can see on the ND over here, we can see the aircraft is 500 feet above us. So they are at 309, we should be at 304 or thereabouts, that's correct. And if we look out we might be able to see them. Oh, I think there they are. Ryanair 2610. Have a good flight. See what else is around. I didn't know you could do this in Avitab. This is nice. So we're just coming up alongside Toulouse. Um, if anything happens right now, Toulouse has got some nice long runways because Airbus is based at Toulouse, um, and they use that for you know testing out some of the large aircraft that they build. So yeah, if we have any faults, if we have any problems, then they've got some nice big runways there for us to to land on. Some more traffic over there. Um, and just in front of us. There they are, you can see the contrail. That one is Iberia 33 Golf Zulu, I think. It's probably going to be near 320. And we are going to pass behind them. This is very nice. I've got to say, Avitab, this is, this is a good bit of kit. Does it give us any of the uh, online air traffic control? I'm not sure it does. My aircraft. Uh, waypoints? Ooh, yeah, look, it can get. Oh, go away. Turn on the waypoints. Uh, air strips. Nice. Oh, look at this. This is decent. There you go, you've got Toulouse Blagnac, which is where um, Airbus is based. So yeah, we've got options here, and then once you've passed Toulouse, what would be the next? Uh, we've got Bordeaux. Bordeaux's got some good runways. Um, can't be that far away from France, Limoges. Oh no, Paris is all the way up there, you know. Okay. 
click on there. Don't want the view RDMEs. This is very nice. Get rid of that. What does that do? Uses X plane earth textures as a map. Oh that is that is clever. Uh open topography Okay to Navigraph Hi. Oh wow, that is so cool. So I don't have a Navigraph paid subscription. I do use Simbrief, which like I said earlier on is free. Um I am extremely cheap. I don't like paying for things. Um I would probably pay for Avitav to be honest. Because this is extremely impressive. Uh what else have we got in here? So we've got charts, I've stuck this in here, which we'll we'll go through occasionally. So after NatP we should be entering the France FIR, flight information region. Um if there was any air traffic controllers online, is there? Oh it's L F E E. Rhymes control. Okay. Might get asked to switch over to them at some point. Uh what else have we got? Ground delivery ATIS. Espana. Portugal. We've got London South Cent uh London South Control is online, so as soon as we cross the channel we'll make contact with them. They're on one two nine decimal forty five. Um but yeah, I don't know where Rhymes is. And we're still getting fifty frames a second. That's that's not bad for basically a, a computer. Well, okay, so the, the the graphics card I bought a few years ago, just before the pandemic. Um and the rest of my system is actually brand new, literally built last weekend. Um until recently I I was running a PC that I built in twenty fourteen, Christmas twenty fourteen. Um so it's quite old and I thought I would treat myself because um, 'cause I'm I'm always on my computer. It's a good investment. I get a lot of return on the investment. So I've just bought um at the heart of it, the processor is a brand new thirteenth generation Intel I five. So I'm going overboard, it's just an I five, but it's got uh I think it's sixteen no, it's got fourteen cores. It's got six performance cores and eight economy cores. Um but it's also got it also provides those to the operating system as twenty virtual cores. So it's got twenty cores, which is nice, because I had four beforehand. Um that's the sound of me breaking my chair. So the it's a th it's an I thirteen um six hundred KF. There's two different models of the 13th generation Intel. You can get the K, which has got built-in graphics chipset, which I didn't need because I've got discrete graphics. And there's the KF. So I saved about 50 or 60 pounds by going for the KF rather than the K. Um, the performance is phenomenal. Definitely seen a big improvement. The CPU was definitely the bottleneck previously. Um, I think now it is becoming the GPU, which is nice because I, I know where to go next. But I actually think the the hard drives are also a bit of a bottleneck. Um, I'm going to get some nice NVMe hard disks, hard drives. Um, so yeah, really happy with 54 FPS. I think at this stage I would have been getting about 20 with the old CPU. Um, I'm running Linux, so maybe I can have a quick look at the system monitor and just see what is currently maxed out. CPUs, yeah, the CPUs are largely under 20%. There's a few spiking between 60 and 100 doing various tasks, but it's only, it's only two or three of them. Most of the cores are between 0 and 5%, really. Um... Yeah. So this is quite good. I I have found the A350 model to be quite light on the on the resources of the machine. It's one of the reasons I like it. But we'll also see how how that 
So I'm just checking the fuel again. I just can't understand why that's so far out of what we asked. That's very strange. I'll have to check that. Double check that next time. So we'll have to check out what those flight uh, frames per second, the FPS, does when we get to Heathrow. So bringing a very complex aircraft into a very complex city with lots of world objects and a very, very complex air airport, um, we will start to see that frames per second drop considerably. I will be surprised if we keep above 20 frames a second going into Heathrow. So I may turn down a little bit of the anti-aliasing which uh, stops the jagged edges on the edges of things um, and I may turn down the world objects just a touch just to give me that uh, like I mentioned at the start I'm happy to sacrifice the quality of the visuals for the quality of the flight model I'm here to fly I'm not here to look out the window and gawk not always anyway um, so yeah I'd, I'd rather have that good flight model particularly on landing and particularly on approach So this is going quite smoothly, apart from the problem that we had with the, with the throttle not so long ago. Um, can't be that far away. You can see, uh, yeah, so Heathrow is just within that 480 nautical mile ring now. So we're less than 500 miles away from Heathrow. Let's check our predicted arrival time against our charts against our flight plan rather. So if we go back into Avitab. First time I've really used Avitab in anger. This is quite nice. You can see the frames per second come down quite a bit and I'm not sure why. Interesting. So charts. Um, at what point were we expected to... what's our next waypoint? Our next waypoint is set G. Sechi, we expected to arrive at Sechi. Does this give us time? Probably gives us elapsed time from the starting point. Okay, let's go back to the first page because I know that that gives us our departure and arrival time. So we expected to land at EGLL at 15.11 local time. So that is in just under an hour. I don't think we're going to make that. Uh, let's have a look over here. It says here we will land at 15.27. So we are actually going to be 26 minutes late getting into Heathrow. I wonder, can we change our performance? Are we in the cruise yet? No, we're still climbing. Still actually climbing. What we can do is override the speed. Um, the A350, as you can see, is still climbing at Mach decimal 847. Um, we can quite comfortably fly at 8. 7, especially in smooth air like this. If it was turbulent you wouldn't want to do this because your speed can go up and down and it can either make you it can make, it make you overspeed is what you don't want because that can add unnecessary stress to the airframe. But yes we are more than within um, our capacity to take that up to decimal 87. We, for some reason we have a lot of additional fuel on board so we're not going to run out of fuel by pumping a lot more fuel into the engines and this should start to reduce. Yeah, you can see the time has come down from 14... Oh, no, it's gone up. Why has that gone up? Was that not 14.27 before? This is a strange flight. 14.30 with 19 tonnes on board. That should have been 9 tonnes on board. That's so strange also explains earlier why we saw, well I saw a message earlier on which I didn't shout about because I thought it was from when we were setting up the aircraft which said check CG 
um, check centre of gravity, and that's because at some point this plane has decided to create some more fuel in its fuel in its fuel tanks. So, yeah, bizarre. Okay, so we have um, the fuel pumps. These are fuel pumps. These squares are fuel pumps. Anything with the dash through them are fuel pumps that aren't turned on. And the fuel pumps with the straight lines are the ones that are turned on. So you can see we actually have additional pump uh, pumps available in all of our tanks. Right now we have what's called tank to engine. So the left wing fuel tank is fueling the left engine. The right fuel tank is fueling the right engine and um, there is no fuel flowing between these fuel tanks. Now what you can have is if you have an imbalance, so particularly if you have like a strong crosswind or something, one engine might actually be working slightly harder than the other. You can see the fuel burn is slightly higher in one than the other. Um, then you may find that you're burning a lot more fuel from one side than the other. You may just have an inefficient engine, or you may, your engine may have a little bit of a problem, and it has to burn a bit more, bit more fuel um, to deliver the same thrust output is its sister engine. Um, it does happen and you can you can sort of funnel fuel between these engines as well. Um, you can s I, I believe that's what this bit in the middle up here is representing. I think this is the uh, this is what's called the cross feed. So if you look at the cross feed up hang on let me get to a better position. So here is our fuel panel um, and everything is basically lights out as it should be. Um, if you wanted to turn on the cross feeds we can do that. That's open. Do we need to do both at the same time? I guess we don't. So if we have a look back down now you can see that additional lines have been drawn on, on the fuel page and we now have fuel from both engines fueling both tanks. Now what this could mean is we we can actually switch off we could switch off the left fuel pump. Okay, you probably wouldn't want to do this for real unless there was an actual problem. But if we want to, um, I expect I'm probably about to break the aircraft. But now you can see that the right fuel tank is actually feeding into this tank, and the fuel so we actually. We don't want to be in this position for too long, so we'll put these back on. In that situation, what happens is the we've actually transferred fuel, not just into that engine, but we've transferred fuel from this tank into this tank. What we can do is we can now reverse that to get these back to be balanced again. I like a bit of symmetry. So if we go back up here, uh, the cross feed is open turn off those and you can see the number on the right hand side is now going up but the number on the left is going down. So when these get to about 11,870 which is about there, we'll turn these pumps back on and you can see that they're within about 5 kilos, 5-6 kilos of each other and then we'll stop the cross feed because we, s we are now back to a a situation where we can go tank to engine. So there we go. Cross feeds off and we've got tank to engine again. Which is nice. What else can we play with on this journey? So we've done fuel. Let's have a look at the wheels. Um, so interestingly it displays the pressure in all the wheels, just like on your car probably, there's some sort of a pressure warning indicator if your car was built in the last five or so years. Um, and there's no temperature on here. I believe the temperature shows in the top sections if it gets too hot. And if it gets too hot, so the reason why um, it's not actually the tyres that get hot, it's the brakes that get hot. So if you've got a lot of weight, particularly if you've just taken off, you've got a lot of weight for a long flight, something goes wrong like an engine stops working and you want to come back into land, you've got a lot of weight that these brakes need to stop. So you do get an indication of the brake temperature showing up on here. Um, and 
if your brakes are too hot, you can get you can get a phenomenon called brake fade, where your brakes aren't as uh, effective at high temperatures. So after you've landed, if you've got hot brakes, you don't want to keep using them um, very much. You just want to try and you know taxi around at slow speeds, try to stay off the brakes, get on the chocks as soon as that you as soon as you're on stand. But also you have the um, if they are hot, this hot logo uh, up here will display in an orangey red colour and then you can turn on your brake fans and that will cool everything right down. Let's see the fans are on. Not quite sure that, what that would do in flight. Um, so yeah, we've got... Uh, so these circles with lines is the gear doors. So again, these are hydraulically operators. Um, so these doors are powered by the green system, uh, the green hydraulic system, and the nose wheel it looks as controlled by the yellow system. Um, the brakes on the nose wheel are powered by the yellow hydraulic system and also an electric system. And you can see we've got electrical backups for the yellow and green on the brakes too. So the what else does that look at? Not I'll probably mislead you if I start speaking about these. Um, yeah, I'm not going to go into those things in case I do mislead you. Um, so that's accumulated pressure. Um, I'm assuming that's going to be hydraulic accumulation. And so this is interesting. This is that there is a lot of friction built up on aircraft as they push themselves through the air. So the saturated temperature, the outside temperature right now, is actually minus 48 degrees Celsius. But the temperature at tip TAT. The temperature that's experienced by the the front or the nose of the aircraft is is only only it'll be flipping freezing minus 14 degrees Celsius, and that is that difference is caused by the friction. The friction is heating up the air from four, minus 48 degrees Celsius to minus 14 degrees Celsius, um, and you can see that in this part of the world we expected it to be minus 44 degrees Celsius on international standard atmosphere slightly colder than that, so we need to take that into consideration as minus 4 degrees when we're doing calculations from the performance pages of the of the books. Current flight time, since I remember to press the chrono button, is 1 hour 42 minutes. Uh, that's not that's not right, that's not right, because we've only been... F the recording is coming to 2 hours in length, and we only took off an hour ago. So maybe this is... from when we turned on... Something. I don't know what we turned on. So 15 minutes in, probably turned on some some sort of electrical system. Uh, current time is 14:33 uh, local time in the UK. So 13:33 UTC. Our gross weight calculated is 218 kilos. I suspect it's more than that now because we have more fuel all of a sudden. Our gross weight center of gravity is 26. Our fuel on board is about double what we expected at 23 kilo, uh, 23 metric tons. Uh, we are now in Alt Cruise, so we can run our cruise checklist. Alt Cruise is our FMS check. Ecam memo, no smoking, that's fine. Ecam system pages review. We're going through the system pages now. Next thing is descent to preparation. So we'll get the weather shortly for Heathrow. How long have we got? a bit of time. What else can we play with? So we've done uh, the fuel, we've done the wheels, let's go to the doors, hopefully everything's shut. Yes it is, it's all shut. Cabin vertical speed, so the cabin vertical speed is um, how fast the altitude is raising in the cabin. And at, this, at this altitude you don't want it to be raising at all. Um, so the, the cabin, the air in the cabin isn't always held at ground level pressure when you're in the air. It actually climbs up to about six or 8,000 feet. Um, there is probably, if I go to the... Is it under the... Ah, pressure. It'll be another pressure page. So it should probably tell us that the cabin altitude is currently at 7,500 feet. So it's like climbing... Um, climbing a small mountain, basically. And... This is why your taste buds change, so things need stronger taste. 
um, for you to test them at that altitude. Um, this is where deep vein thrombosis becomes more likely because of the, the air bubbles in your blood will increase in size and um, you get dehydrated faster at this altitude as well. Now it's seven and a half thousand feet inside and our external pressure, uh, the difference between the external pressure and the internal pressure. So this is actually how much that lower pressure inside is pushing against the inside of the, the cabin. So inside it is eight and a half times higher pressure than it is outside. So an aircraft is basically a balloon. You fill it full of air so people can still breathe and outside you have lower pressure. So the delta, the differential between the two is 8.1 times. Um, and you can see we're, we're near the near the top of that delta but yeah this balloon can still be inflated a little bit more before it goes pop. Um, you do have aircraft go pop occasionally. There's a very famous story of an Aloha Airlines out of Hawaii 7... I want to say 737, might be 727, one of those two. Um, and yeah, the so part of the side of the aircraft tore open and um, sadly a flight attendant was, was sucked out of the plane at, at altitude um, and lost her life. But yeah, these these are just big balloons. It, more recently, especially with these sorts of aircraft, which have got things like composite components and composite structures and fuselages, it's it's a lot less likely to happen, even though it's already extremely rare. Um, but it is something that needs to be thought about and designed for. So yeah, this all looks good. Um, so we skip the pressure. Let's go back to door. Um, the oxygen system. So we have, I say we, huh, like I'm a real pilot. So there is, uh, ah, I don't actually know where it is on here. Um, I'm in a bit of a strange position. Somewhere down here, there will be an oxygen mask for the pilot to use. What's in here? Does that open? Oh, terrible. Yeah, so there will be an oxygen mask handy for the pilot to use pilots to use um, and you basically measure how full an oxygen tank is by how much pressure it's got. So the cockpit pressure is 1200 psi and cabin um, oxygen is 1200 psi. I'm not sure what that means. Maybe that's for the flight attendants um, because passengers like us in the back get a chemically operated uh, oxygen system which gives, basically gives you 15 minutes of oxygen creation. Um, from a chemical reaction, which is why you, when you yark down, you pull down on those masks, it triggers a chemical reaction. It's not pressure based, so I don't know, uh, that must just be for the flight attendant's masks. Rain repellent level norm, that's really interesting. I'm guessing there's some sort of a fancy rain repellent system in this, in this windscreen. But yeah, that is, I don't know what that is. Let's have a look at the engines. Engines are fun, right? So we're currently at 96% of the uh, maximum continuous operating uh, rotational speed of the... Oh no, sorry. So this is the percentage thrust that can be, can be made from the aircraft, from the engines. Our N1 big fan at the front is spinning at 90% of its con maximum continuous rotation speed. Our intermediate turbine is about the same. Uh, we're throttling back. Why are we throttling back and descending? And OK, we've just got a little bit high, that's all. And you can see our high pressure turbine is uh, at 95%. That's all fine. Fuel flow is coming up to three and a half metric tons per side. Um, Oil quantity is good in both. Uh, is that 51 degrees oil temperature. That's not bad, is it? Not bad at all. Get higher oil temperature in my um, my car. Uh, PSI. So this must be. I don't know what that is. Uh, PSI is normally bleed related, uh, a pneumatic related. Unless that's 
We must have the bleeds open. That's how the whole air conditioning system works. What happens if we warm those up a bit? No idea. Uh, vibration M1, yeah, vibrations. I, I was once told, I was once um, before 9-11, um, I was invited to the cockpit of a 767 that my parents and I flew to uh, to Florida. We went on a Disney World trip. And I remember going into the cockpit and say, oh yeah, I do a lot of flight sim. And they were like, um, what does this mean? And I was like, oh, that's that's the airspeed indicator. And like, what does this mean? And that's the gear lever. And they were like, oh, yeah, that's that's quite cool. And I was like, yeah, I'm a bit of a, a flight nerd, which hasn't changed at all. Um, and then they, they brought up the vibration. I was like, I mean, what what's a good number and what's a bad number? And they said, anything under one and a half is acceptable. And I think at that point in time, the aircraft was showing 0 0.9. This was a, a Britannia... Uh, Boeing 767, I think it must have been a 200, 767-200, so um, maybe CFM 56 engines, not quite sure, um, but yeah, the, the, that aircraft was showing vibration of 0 0.9, this is also 0 0.1, 0 0.3, so I'm assuming this is good. I'm also assuming these would show up as orange or red if it was bad. Uh, nacelle temperature? Um, so that's the engine nacelles. Why would we have something like that? So we may want to have engine anti ice on. Does that change the nacelle temperature? I don't know what that does. Maybe it's not modelled. Uh, let's turn that off as well because we're not in icing conditions at the moment. So that's engines. Um, electric AC power. So we have generators from the engines providing um, 115 volts. Gen 1 and 2. That all looks good. Um, oh, TR. I used to know what that means. That is a... There's a really good video. Um on a really good video from a company called ITVV, Intelligent Television and Video, and they did some great cockpit videos, and there's a guy um, who was the captain of this Airbus A330, and he went through what all of this means. I highly recommend it. I can't remember for the life of me what this means right now. Um, so this is, there's basically two uh, AC buses, you've got your alternating current, you've got AC1, AC2, um, and then you've got your AC essential bus. So your AC essential bus basically powers all the stuff that's absolutely essential, like flight controls. Um, and then I'm guessing this is your AC emergency bus where uh, you can um, maybe use an alternate source for emergency power. The RAT is the, is the Ram Air Turbine. It's a little fan that pops out from the side of the aircraft somewhere around here. I think that might be the panel there. I might be completely wrong. I might, um, should we pop it out? We're on a bit of a wonk. I hope we're turning. Otherwise this plane is drunk. Uh, let's pop the rat. So we've got emergency electrical power. That may have deployed the rat. Nope. Is that the only thing that you used to drop the rat? I thought there would have just been a button. So you've got rat man on auto. 
I do know that once it's deployed, you can't sort of wind it back in until you're on the ground. But maybe it's not modelled. So it's an electrical system. Engine, ditching mode. That's a bit sad. There are some very good... What does that button do? Nah, it's not working, is it? Let's check again. Any rats popped out? None that I can see. No. Oh well. Yeah, so the rat is a little ram air turbine. Ooh, look, it is showing up, it's just not modelled. So the rat is showing um, that it's out in the in the flow of air. 0%, 115 volts. But it's just not displaying in the model, which is okay. The whiz air coming beneath us. Not showing up on TCAS, which is strange. Must be a bit far below, so if we go to TCAS below, still not showing up. Oh well. Okay, so yeah, the Ram Air Terrain is um, a little fan that pops out the side of the aircraft, and the airflow going over it spins a generator, and that gives us power um, initially into the AC essential bus, so it gives us flight controls might stop your movie from playing in the back, but in worst case scenario we've got a way of generating air, uh, generating electricity from the airflow. Uh, so let's see what's next. Uh, electric DC, direct current. Again we've got DC essential. This uh, is, is that recharging the battery? Is that what that arrow means? I would assume so. Um, and then it looks like we have some sort of a, an alternator process going on here where AC is becoming DC, some sort of transformer process. Which is nice. Uh, DC APU. 30 volts, 0 amps. Does that mean... I mean, the APU should be off. Yeah, the APU is off. Which is fine. We will um, do hydraulics. You can see whiz going beneath, of the, beneath us there. Um, hydraulic pumps, we've got yellow and green. Um, is there a blue system on, on this? I don't know. That's a really good point. I haven't seen a B anywhere. Maybe there's just the two. In fact, let's have a look. Yellow and green, yellow and green. Yeah, I don't think there's actually a blue system on here. So two hydraulic systems. Interesting. I think there is three on the A320. So... It's interesting that this is less complicated from a hydraulic point of view. Um, and each of these systems are above 5000 psi, which is good. Flight controls, let's see what they're doing. So right now the autopilot is flying the aircraft. And if you just see these little green dashes, this is the position of the flight controls. So as we do various things, like climb and turn and those sorts of things, we've got a turn coming up. Nothing intentional, but you might just see little blips of controls across the wings as the aircraft tries to keep us nice and level, nice and comfortable. So yeah, I guess the philosophy, the hydraulic philosophy on the A350 is you've got two hydraulic systems and then everything has multiple redundant electrical backups, which makes sense. You know, one of the so, so what I do um, for a job is uh, is basically systems engineering, and um, one of the things that you want to have is diversity. Uh, you want diverse power sources. So if one power source fails, then you've got something that uses a completely different power source to uh, to keep the power going. If, for example, you um, you only have coal power plants in a country, and then you run out of coal, then you're a bit broken but if you've got 
coal powered plants and you've got gas then the likelihood of both of those sources running out at the same time is lower than you know one of them running out which yeah so having diversity across hydraulics and electrical power does make a lot of sense um, from a resilience point of view it's fault tolerant which is nice um, so I was asking before if the APU was switched on let's go to the APU screen just to uh, find out the APU page APU generator is off, the bleed is off um, there's no fuel being used right now but we did use um, like four of me of, of fuel on the ground um, and the exhaust gas temperature is the outside temperature which makes sense it's the ambient temperature how are we doing we do have some traffic off to our left which was a 2e7 kilo lima um, I'm saying these things because I'm really trying to get good at my telephony and just the phonetic alphabet is something that I'm really trying to practice uh, whenever I go for a drive I look at registration plates of cars and I try and say the full registration plate in the phonetic alphabet uh, you know, Alpha Bravo 1, 2, Alpha Bravo Charlie, so for AB 1, 2, ABC as an example. Um, and I try and say it fast. I just try and get used to that muscle memory of using the phonetic alphabet. Uh, it does take a bit of time. It does take a bit of time. So, uh, bleed, let's look at where the the air is coming out. So the air is coming out of the engines right now. Um, the engines are um, pushing air out at about 30 psi. The temperature coming out of the engines is at minus 4, so they are picking up a little bit of heat from the engines themselves. They go through um, a hot air um, heating system, and then they go into the... Um, looks like they're going into the packs, which is the passenger air conditioning kit, basically the air conditioning system, going into the air conditioning system at 11 degrees Celsius, uh, and it looks like there's some additional hot air being pushed in through hot air heaters here. Um, APU is not providing any air but when we got on the ground and shut down the engines then we'll turn on the APU bleed and that will provide a little bit of, uh, well, that will provide all of the air into the cabin. You can see you've got KLM 97 November somewhere below us. Looks like they're actually at an airport on the ground. Let's get back to where we were. Um, how are we doing for time? When do we need to start descending? So we've got about 100 miles before we start descending and we will be speaking to London South Control. Uh, what's SC? That's oh, centre, isn't it? So London S Control. We need to speak to one of those two shortly. Okay, doke. Um, let's quickly work through the rest of these buttons then. So we've done bleed, cond, so this is air conditioning system. Um, you can see we've got, right now the avionics system is being fed from air. That's actually gone through uh, the cockpit and the cabin first. Um, we've got some of the vents are slightly open. Um, probably not that open in reality. We've got cargo air, so cargo is being heated to 14, it's a 4 degrees there, 14 degrees there. Um, so basically any, if you were transporting animals, then they would be, um, you'd make sure that the temperature in the cargo hold, which is controlled up here, cargo, um, so we would do the forward, so if we set that to like 20 degrees, we should be able to start seeing this forward cargo area starting to heat up. And we'd make sure that was nice and comfortable for any aircraft or livestock that we were carrying. Um, rest here, that looks like the rest area for the crew. You can see the cargo heat is just starting to come up a little bit. And then the final button that we're going to look at is the pressure which we've already... Oh no, we didn't have a look at this, did we? Oh, we did. So, yep, yeah, cabin altitude hasn't changed and you can see the, um, the cabin pressure is being maintained by closing these, these vents. Okay, um, if we have a look at video, you get a, a cheesy video of inside, which I don't think they actually have. 
cabin feed, what are the do they do anything else? No. Uh what's dispatch? Normal, that's good. Normal is always good. STS Rat requires maintenance. So as I mentioned before, once the rat has been popped out, it needs to be put back into the aircraft via the maintenance team. There's no way of winding it back in, so um, that's just letting the maintenance team. I'm slightly impressed that that is modelled. Very impressed. What if I go to more? No, that's just more within that section. Cool. So we need to prepare for landing. Our descent is going to be starting uh, in just under 80 miles. I'm going to go up here and get the weather. WXEGLL. Um, and it is uh, zero three zero at nine knots, so I suspect we'll be landing to the east, which is unusual. Um, QNH one zero zero eight Q one zero zero eight. You will create your own, or you'll develop your own shorthand for making notes for these things. Um, yeah, so we're going to have wind from the north. We need to point our nose slightly towards the north on approach. Uh, nine knots. It, that will be a slight factor. Um, it will want to blow us to the south, so we'll point to the north. Uh, QNH1008. Um, and the airfield elevation is 83 feet, which if you go to the pressure page, it shows you here, landing elevation 83 feet. It needs to know that, the aircraft needs to know that because it needs to gently de depressurize the aircraft as we descend to match the landing elevation so that when you open the doors, first of all you can open the doors, there's not too much pressure on the inside that's holding the doors shut, which is actually what happens in flight. Right now you could not, however hard you tried, open the doors because you've got 8 pounds per square inch of pressure. Um, on the door, so you've effectively got several tons of pressure on the door. Um, so yeah, they just will not open. But yeah, the landing elevation is required to know what to depressurize down to. Uh, let's have a quick look at the map. See where we are in relation. So we are up here, and we are about to head out over the English Channel, which I suspect means that we will be getting a ping from London South Centre. Why have we got two of them? London S Centre. London Control. I'm going to have a quick look on a site called VAT Glasses, V A T Glasses dot UK. And this lets you have a look to see. Um, where the different sectors are. So we will be coming up through Londres to here and we will need to speak to 12945. 12945. So we'll get that one. I keep saying so. Apologies. It's still going to happen. So we'll go over here and we type in 124. 129.45 We get that ready and then we can just hit this button over here to swap between Unicom and London South and I can see myself on back glasses right now which is quite cool let's give my ears a rest from this headset for a moment because it's not designed to be used for extremely long periods of time. Squishing my ears. Uh, we've got a checklist to do. Weather has been obtained. Landing election. So is it going to be the captain or is it going to be the first officer? It's going to be the captain because that's me. Um, barometer ref reference preset. So 1008. How do I pre-configure that? Active flight plan info destination EGLL somewhere on here. Enter destination data. Okay, where do I do that? Position secondary data data airport in op marvelous. Is it in it? Mm 
<laughs> performance ah here we go um, so we go to the approach page we set the QNH to be 1008 outside air temperature is let's have a look back at that 8 degrees not a nice 17 degrees like we left behind um, we will set our minimums to be barrow altitude of we'll say 200 feet off the ground so um, yeah 283 with an elevation of 83 feet a lot of air, a lot of air traffic control has come online there um, I said I was going to say magnetic wind, so the the wind is uh, from 0 to 3 zero, and it's 9 knots. So we'll have a crosswind component of minus 1 knots. And yeah, that's good. Let's, so we've got the borrow check, ECAM status memo, no smoking, rat out, correct, that's all expected. Approach data inserted. Uh, so we don't know which runway we're going to be landing on just yet. But what I will do is pull up the Avitab tablet. If we go to the home, go to airports, get rid of the level ones, Barcelona, and can we pull up the oh here we go right airport taxiways so I suspect we will be landing on runway zero nine left and we will be expecting to come off uh we can probably stop at about alpha nine alpha nine west we'll hope for alpha nine west if not eight or seven we will normally be asked to go onto the inner taxiway so we'll be asked to taxi through one of the uh taxiway hotel link 11 12 13 something like that um onto taxiway bravo the inner taxiway and then we will go Bravo. So we took off from Terminal 5B yesterday. So if we do the same now, it'll be Taxiway C, Charlie. Um, otherwise, it'll be. We might park on that side of Terminal 5B, in which case it'll be Bravo or C. The other one that I want to get is the um, docking chart, Terminal 5 docking chart. And this gives you the numbers of all of the different stands. Um, 503 being the one that I'm used to most because that's where typically the uh, Heathrow to Newcastle flight arrives and departs from to and from. Yesterday I flew down to Barcelona and we took off from 541 so I suspect we'll be somewhere in this region. Somewhere around Terminal 5B, maybe Terminal 5C because we are a speedbird and Terminal 5 is all speedbirds or British Airways. Um, other thing that we're going to need is we're going to need some kind of arrival chart. Ground movement. Ah, so we need to go back to the list. Back. Arrival. And then we've got all of the arrivals here. So it's going to be a... I think it's going to be an Ockham. Maybe an Ockham. Maybe a... Bovingdon Lambourne's off to the north east Honley is a possibility don't know where Nugra is that's Lambourne Tobid no idea we will speak to air traffic control shortly we will find out but at least we've got our taxi chart and our docking chart ready to go. Please contact me 12945. 12945. And then we'll try and squeeze a word in. Engines. Russian radar, 
Delta 64 with you crossing the pond, available 320. Good evening. <coughs> Delta 64, London Control, hello. Um, you might want to double check the flight plan you filed in future because you simply stopped on the other side of the Atlantic. Uh, <coughs> oh, excuse me. I guess we've uh, Delta 64, it's the on -net. one hotel arrival, Squawk 2173. One hotel arrival, what was the squawk code? Squawk 2173. 173, Delta 64. London Control, good afternoon, Speedbird 489 with you, Federal 380, request descent. Speedbird 489 at London, Squawk 6223, Rock Sock, one hotel arrival. Squawk 6223, please say the, the arrival again, SPBird 489. Speedbird 489 at Rocksock 1 Hotel Arrival. Rocksock 1 Hotel Arrival, Speedbird 49, thanks. Delta 64, descent flight level 130 to be leveled by Hazel. Rocksock 1 Hotel, that's not one I am familiar with. Delta 64, we're descent flight level 130 to be leveled by Hazel. Available 130 by Hazel, Delta 64. Mm -hmm. Control, this is Ryanair 6983, climbing flight level 3703. Ryanair 6983, London, climb flight level 370. Climb flight level 370, Ryanair 6983. Control, one, uh, Rockstar, one, 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 and you're climbing to 1-6 now. Climbing to 1-6, okay. Now, that wasn't an instruction, that was an observation that you're 3,000 above what you should be. Continue climb flight level 1-9-0. Climb 1-9-0, Tom Jet 1-9-0. Clear on to your on frequency, we do that. Next, Speedbird 3-2-2. Multiple aircraft, Speedbird 1-3-1, London's the Kunav-1 Golf arrival. Descent flight level 160 to be leveled by Amdut. Rocksog. Need level 160, Kunav 1 Golf uh, arrival, speed 1 through. Left hands of 5, Mike Charlie, the Kunav 1 Golf, descent flight level 160 to be leveled by Amdut. Mike Charlie, 1 Golf and descending flight level 160 at Amdut, left hands of 5, Mike Charlie. Speedbird 489 and squawk 6223. Apologies, 6223, Speedbird 489. Left hand to five, two, Mike Charlie on conversion three, speed to conversion Squawk. speed three hundred or greater. That's me getting speed at one three one on conversion speed to eight zero knots. I'm gonna have to descend very soon. Three one three one three two zero knots. Just confirm on conversion speed to eight zero knots. Three one three one on conversion speed to eight zero knots. Come on, give me a descent. Should I just be descending with the uh, speedbird for it? And please confirm to descend with the arrival. Speedbird for it and a descent flight level one three zero to be leveled by Hazel. Flight level 130, level by Hazel, Speedbird 489. Speedbird 266, Romeo 1, ready, descent flight level 130, to be level by Telti. Okay, so we've got initial descent to 130. Uh, when ready, descent to flight level 130, to be level by Telti, Speedbird 266, Romeo. Let's have a look, see where's that going to be. There we go, we've got a constraint, flight level 130 at Hazel. That is correct. So we might need a bit of help. Delta 64 contact London control you can see that blue arrow. That is our level out point, so we should be leveling out at 130 at Hazel. This guy knows what London to control do. with you, bar 7, heading 160, level 270. Just check the audio. What was that frequency again, Delta 64? Just turn in the air traffic control pitch. It's quite loud, isn't it? Do, do, do. Sorry, just checking the volumes. Checking the levels.
vehicles. Nice thing about the flight factor is that it uses the tallest components. Tallest is Tolis is widely regarded as being some of the best um, Airbus components you can get. So you can see our level off point at Hazel is good, and then we've got fur it's requesting further descent after that. So now on the arrival. Currently 14.11, just notice that time up there, that's important because that was our original expected landing time. Let's just jump to 4, oh no, oh no, no 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 no, that's our next time. No that's right, so it is 14.11 now, we've just crossed over Roxog at 14.11. Contact London 134125, speed with 489, thanks. So that is 134, 134125, is that right? 134125 and swap. London Control, good afternoon, Speedbird 489. Flight level 130, Speedbird 489. So that was us just checking in with the controller, especially in busy scenarios, we just give them your call sign. They'll ask you for any additional information that they need. Um, other aircraft have been asked to check in with their speed or their altitude. We hadn't, we were just asked to, to call them and there's generally communication between the different controllers. So I had assumed that our flight level, our cleared flight level had been passed on. In this case it hadn't. Runway we should be landing on. I've assumed zero nine left. Um, I'm going to ask. It's good practice. Uh, Speedbird four eight nine, please confirm for planning which runway we will be landing on. If um, thanks Speedbird four eight nine, which means go get the bloody ATIS, you idiot. So what's the ATIS? E G L L ATIS. Is one zero zero information. Speed is four, Amy Omega. 
HELL it is. So, arrival 9 left, information India. Zero zero nine. This is exactly why I specify the runway. Yeah. What are you doing? Oh dear. It's very easy to make mistakes. Clearances are not available for Compton departures. Departing aircraft make initial contact with London Control. Acknowledge receipt of information India and aircraft type on first contact. That's entirely my bad. I didn't get the ATIS. Should have. And we're getting in amongst the clouds. Now this plane doesn't rock very much. This plane doesn't move around in the clouds. Do 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 do. I really hope that this is useful for some people. Very cloudy outside. What does that look like from the outside? Cloudy. Oh, you can see the wings wobbling. Oh, we are not going to make Hazel by 1.30. Come on. Going to need some speed brakes. I'd assumed that that meant that the aircraft would have done that for us. Best rate of descent, flight level 90, speedbird 489. Flight level 90. So we can probably. Okay, so approach data, position, sec, order, break. Descent at 10,000 feet, which is coming up. Exterior lights set. Landing lights, didn't turn them on. Marvellous. Check, seatbelt sign. Flight data set, barrow ref. We'll set it at 1009. Where we get. Heading zero four zero speed boat four eight nine. For some reason that wasn't holding the best rate of descent. I've got some things to learn about this aircraft, for sure. Ouch. Speeding up quite a bit. One one nine seven two five. Speed with four eight nine. Why is that not out? One one nine seven. 
Oh Mann, nein. Oh Mann, nein. Seven. Oh Mann, nein. Seven, two, five. Good afternoon, Speedbird 4 at 9 with you, descending fellow uh, 90. Descend flight level 80, Speedbird 4 at 9. Left 320 degrees, Speedbird 4 at 9. 320. This is all because I have not descended quickly enough to Hazel, so it's messing everything else up. So that's going to take us just slightly wide of that initial approach fix there. Wet outside, typical soggy London afternoon. Descend 4000 feet QNH 1008, speedbird 489. So we are descending below the uh, below the transition altitude, which means that we can go onto the QNH, which is 1008. And let's pull back the Pull back the uh, speed brakes. Continue to descend here. Um, let's put the landing system on. I'd just like to see when the localizer and the glide slope show up. And we have just set the barrow reference. Checked. Descent rate is good. Well, it wasn't good. It is now speed brakes as required. Weather on EFIS. Um, so we can get the weather showing up on the electronic flight information system here. Holding pattern as required, we will be told then if we need to. Um, we're going to be doing a precision approach. Uh, approach phase monitoring speed, speed brakes as required. And then we'll press the approach button on the flight, uh, on the FCU there. I'll call it the Descend 3000 feet, QNH 1008, speedbird 489. So we do need a bit of speed break. And that should arrest that climbing speed a bit. I'm asking for a lot of descent rate. It's not really that much. But these are very slippy aircraft. Uh, sorry, confirm the heading again. Turn right zero six zero when established. Descend with the glide. Uh, speedbird four eight nine. So turn right on two zero six zero. Oops, zoomed in rather than rotated. Zero six zero. And at this point, we are going to wait until we are heading towards the airfield, and then we will hit the approach button ok 
Okay, uh, so we are 15 miles out. I'm not going to lower any flaps yet. That's probably about the right speed for this distance. Get the approach. See, now that's not going to let me intercept. That is... Is it? I don't think that's going to let me intercept there. Flight plan... Age. Turn right, one two zero to establish four eight nine. One two zero. So our nav, the approach. Runway zero nine left, approach ILS zero nine. Okay, so that should be better. There's the ILS, right. Okay, so we're going to maintain one two zero degrees until established. At this point, I'm going to drop a notch of flaps. We've got the approach is armed, we've got glide slope armed blue. Localizer blue, and then we can zoom in a bit. There we go. Localizer is established. Uh, localizer is. Ooh, why has the autopilot gone off? The autopilot is not playing ball. So, okay, it's all down to me. No idea why that's just suddenly gone off. So, hang on, need the auto throttle on. Why has that gone off? Is that going to come back on again? Come on. Come on, you can do it. Autopilot, approach, glide slope, localizer. Let's get some flaps out. Runway zero nine left, clear to land speed bird four eight nine. Cannot see the runway at all. Need a bit more help uh, on the speed. Four flaps. <clears throat> Visual with the runway. There. I'm going to have to go around it, Heathrow. Dropping below the glide slope. So we're just going to watch that green cross. Too low. Come on. That was the worst landing I've ever done. Delta 2 Yankee, ready for a taxi to Ramiz at 
Taxi Bravo Link 51, hold November Bravo 8. Bravo Link Lima uh, 5, could you please do one more time? That's the same kit. It's Bravo Link 51, hold November Bravo 8. Okay, so I'm going to turn right here and get out of the way of any of the landing traffic. instructions now. Speed 489, run with a kid. Speed 489, take a second right on Bravo, stand 533. Second right on to Bravo, stand 533, speed 489. So, we want to be straight ahead here. So this is the inners, this is what we expected, and then we are going to be going to Taco Tablet. Where's 533? Three, three. So we'll be going on to Bravo. Bravo here. Stay on Bravo. All the way through to Terminal 5B to the west of Terminal 5B. So that was a horrendous landing, I'm not going to lie. I would have gone around if it wasn't already three hours of your valuable time. Um, and I probably should have allowed the, the ILS, uh, the auto land, just to land that one and then claimed it as my own. But you would have known. Turn that guy down just a touch. But yeah, that was horrendous. I was too low. We should have gone, gone around. Um, I do need a bit more practice on the Airbus. To be honest, building up muscle memory in the Airbus A350 is not my priority at the moment. Doing it in the Cessna is, because that's what I'm learning in. For real. Um, but yeah, that was awful, wasn't it? That was really, really bad. I think what would have been better is if I had disconnected the autopilot much earlier and just got used to the dynamics of the aircraft through the arrival. Even things like um, just saying, you know, runway vacated is not... I, my mouth doesn't know how to form that naturally yet. I need to say that a bunch of times. Okay, so this is Delta, and then Charlie, oh no, Bravo, no, we're on Bravo, heading to Charlie, and then over there, we'll turn left onto Bravo over there to, um, to stand 533, so, don't know if flaps, localizer capture, auto brakes, ground spoilers was done, ECAM, wheel page, Table stored, flight parameters done, that was final approach, uh, landing, flared, FMA flare thrust, following both cases, reverser, reverser, auto brake, disarmed, autopilot disconnect, yep, um, didn't go around, should have, but didn't, after landing, ground spoilers. Make sure those are in. Those are in, but they'll come up pink for some reason. Flaps to zero. Selected. Master switch for the APU is on. Uh, APU page up on the EFIS. So is this where we want to be? This is Bravo here. So we'll make a left turn here and we're going to park up at 533. APU page, we're going to start the APU there. We're going to wait for the APU to become available. Delta, okay, I came from November, Bravo, wait for my 
bit of power to get around the corner. Ippy is available. Ippy bleed is on. Anti ice is and ice is required. As required. Landing lights. Landing lights off. Nose lights to taxi. Strobe lights off. ND zoom is required. Weather on EFIS, terrain on EFIS, monitor the brake temperature. So we don't have a hot light on the brake fan. Where's 533? Three, three? That's 532. So next one is us. There's Delta 2 Foxtrot Yankee down there. And that's our stand just there. I'm going to swap to the outside view just so that we can get a marshal's eye view of the situation. Swing it a bit wide. Whoop, too low. Too low. Too low, pull up. The spoiler's still up. Is that what that effect there is? No. Don't know. Okay, so the thing that we need to watch for here is on the ground. Oh, how do I see that? Okay, it's not showing me, but because we're a long aircraft, I'm going to pull it forward a bit. Nope, let's roll it all the way forward. To there. Perfect. Um, so let's jump back in the aircraft. Have we got a hot light yet? No, we don't. We've done okay. We are going to go to ground services. First thing we want is chocks in. Chocks. Um, we want to want the plane at the gate, want cleaning truck ULD, yada yada yada. We want these two available to us. We want to engage that passenger, not only passenger bus fuel. And we want to um go through this. So brig temperature is good. Parking. Nose lights off. When we turn off lights off. Parking brake is on, but then I'm going to take it off because we've got chocks. Engine master switches, off. Seatbelt selector, off. Bing bong. Uh, didn't turn on the APU generator. Beacon, off. Fuel pump. Fuel pump, off. Fuel pump two, off. Securing the aircraft. Parking brake, we've got chocks, that's fine. Crew oxygen, uh, let me just find a better position to do this. Okay, crew supply of oxygen, off. Ideas, off. Whoops. APU, bleed, push button. Off. APU master switch. So we've got external power. Pop the external power around just for a moment. Turn off the APU. No smoking selector. Off. Wireless. Off. Cabin satcom. Off. Landing camera. All of these. Doesn't seem to work anywhere. One and two fuel pumps. Fuel pump one, fuel pump two, center tank, center tank feeder. Is that the one? Yeah. 
Minutes panel all wet, let's off, I don't know what that means. Battery one, off. Off. Turn all this off. Securing the aircraft. Turn that off. Turn that off. We are down. Disconnect. Good control of that. And here we are. All systems switched off. Three hours and seven minutes later after starting our flight. Oh, there's no, no aircraft anymore because I've disconnected from Vatten. But yeah, here we are at soggy Heathrow. Um, thank you for spending your time watching this. Um, hope it's been informative in places. I'm sure it has been. Um, and I'm sure it's been puzzling in some places why I've been subjecting myself to doing this flight without reading the full manual. But maybe we've learned some things together. Um, still don't know why we had that throttle issue um, on Klein. That was very confusing to me. Um, overall, I do rate the flight factor A350 XWB. I think it's a, it's a very nice piece of kit, especially if you like playing with menus, looking at data. Um, a lot of the systems are modeled. Practically all the systems are modeled. Um, and there you go. There's, there's proof that you can do a full flight end-to-end -end, um, without hitting anything that's inoperable. Um, yeah, I hope you've enjoyed it. I certainly have. And I might see you next time, maybe with an aircraft that I understand a little bit better, like a Cessna 150 again. Take care.